keep the Seller family keep Kelly in her prayers Kelly's son Matilda died on uh, Friday and so um, we will be preparing for a, a memorial service at some point so I will let you know when we, when we get to that point I'm just going to uh, work with Kelly and be there so keep them in prayer. I, I, I cannot imagine. I really can't. I cannot imagine. Today is Barbara's birthday. She's not here. She didn't want us to harass her properly. Uh, I'm always saying she's 94. She's actually turned 84 today. And uh, I told her I was going to let everybody know. So. Uh, keep her in prayer. Keep Marty in prayer. She's still waiting to get to uh, her cardiologist. It's too, they're waiting too long. And so pray for her. Pray for her sons. I know her sons. I guarantee you they're calling there every day. Trying to get things to change. There are many other things going on. If I miss something, I'm sorry. But there is, there is so many things going on in our world today. It's going on in our lives. It's going on in our, our families, in our church, in our workplace. I got to tell you, <clears throat> God plans everything. Not me. I pick these songs from a possibility of 20 sets on Wednesday. I forgot that today is the 21st anniversary of September the 11th, 2001, when our nation was attacked. I don't know if you remember that. It's been a long time. And Karen said to me, hey, you know what Sunday is? And I said, yeah, Sunday. And she said, no, September 11th. It hit me like a ton of bricks. You'll hear more about it in the sermon today. I actually found the sermon that I preached in 2001, which meant I was a little bit younger as a pastor then. And I, I read the sermon. And I thought, Lord, we, we forgot already. It didn't take us long to forget. But God's people, we can't quit. We can't give up. And so this morning I would ask that you would stand. We're going to begin our service by singing the national anthem. And just as the video showed, remembering those that have lost their lives in the September 11th attack and all those many first responders that were there. Many of them died just trying to help other people.
continue to worship this for your tithes and offerings.
Lord, I pray this morning that we can just take your words hard. That we will use it each and every day of our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you can see the theme this morning. Like I said, it was a plan for us to sing songs about battle and victory. But here we are. So often, when bad things happen, it affects us, it changes us, but it doesn't last. I don't normally read my notes. If you look at my notes on Sermon Central, you will definitely realize that what I say doesn't usually completely match up with what's on paper. The points will, the title will, but a lot of things I say are not in here. But this morning, I'm going to intentionally read from the sermon that I preached on the Sunday after September the 11th, 2001, as the World Trade Center was demolished by those planes. I remember that when that happened on a Tuesday, that all over the city, we had times of prayer. All over the city. On that Wednesday night, all over the city, we had times of prayer. Churches met together, we got together, we prayed. The same on Thursday, the same on Friday, the same on Saturday, and on Sunday there probably wasn't a single pastor in the nation that did not preach about what happened on September the 11th. Reading from my notes. We live in a great country of technology, government structure, well, military defense, military intelligence services, etc. Unfortunately, our country has learned this week that sometimes all of our power is not enough. Tuesday morning, as I said, watching my television, I was stunned. You know, we see things like this happening in other countries all the time, but it never has much effect on me. But for me, all I could do Tuesday was sit with tears in my eyes and pray. Although I am sure you know this, I will share with you the chronological order of events on Tuesday morning. Mikey Small, which was the young man that was here, gave me this information. He took this off the internet from CNN. In your bulletin this morning, as you open it, and there on the right hand side, you will find the chronological order of what happened. At 8.45 a.m., a large plane, possibly a hijacked airliner, crashes into one of the World Trade Center towers, tearing a gaping hole in the building and setting it on fire. 9.03 a.m., a second plane, apparently a passenger jet, crashes into the second World Trade Center tower and explodes. Both buildings are burning. 9.17 a.m., the FAA shut down all New York City airports. 9.21 a.m., New York City Port Authority orders all bridges and tunnels in the New York City area closed. 9.50 a.m., President Bush, speaking in Florida, says the country has suffered an apparent terrorist attack. 9.40 a.m., the FAA halts all flight operations at U.S. airports. 
The first time in U.S. history that air traffic nationwide has been halted. 9.43 a.m. and air, aircraft crashes into the Pentagon, sending up a huge plume of smoke. Evacuation begins immediately. 9.45 a.m., the White House evacuates. 9.57 a.m., President Bush departs from Florida. 10.05 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses, plummeting into the streets below. A massive cloud of dust and debris forms and slowly drifts away from the building. 10.08 a.m., Secret Service agents armed with automatic rifles are deployed into Lafayette Park across from the White House. 10.10 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93 crashes into Somerset County, Pennsylvania, southeast of Let me continue to read from my notes. I'm going to stop here, but as we all know, there were many more things that occurred. sorrow and mourning, but I also believe it is a wake-up call for a nation that once was a godly nation. Our nation as a whole has become complacent concerning the things of God. Sin is no longer a big deal to most people. We have rationalized the question of sin so long that our children can't even really distinguish what is sin and what is not. Our churches have become places of argument and politics instead of places of prayer and worship. Our leaders in our churches seek power and authority instead of humbleness and servitude to God. Our nation has become so powerful and smart that we decided to put God on the back burner. Without God, this is just a glimpse of what could happen. Let me assure you that I am not glad that this has happened, but we need to realize the spiritual aspect of what has happened that we better turn back to God. This is the introduction to my sermon from Sunday after 7, September 11th attack. I know that's lengthy, but all of those things happened, didn't they? <clears throat> Our country, as we know, it was changed dramatically. And there for a moment, our nation realized that we had turned away from God and that we needed to turn back. And we did. And months and months and months went by as they were cleaning up all the debris in New York. And every day that went by became a little less of a remembrance to us. By the next year, I preached a sermon that basically asked the question, why did we forget? 21 years later, we have still forgotten what God is trying to teach us. Not only has our nation not turned back to God, but we have went further away from God as a nation. As a nation, we now have politicians and people promoting abortion. I read this week, and it angered me so bad, that there is some politicians, and we'll just say on the left, liberal <laughs> politicians, that said that Jesus never said not to have abortions. They said that. They said that it was okay for abortions because Jesus didn't say not to do it. Well, I think the Bible is pretty clear about murder and killing. The Bible's pretty clear, isn't it? And yet the world wants to twist and twist and twist and say it's okay for men to compete as women. It's okay for them to mutilate children and change their sex. It's okay to do those things. And let me tell you, it's not. If you wonder how our nation got to where we have a food shortage, where gasoline is off the chart, and as we talked about it before Sunday school, man, the letter just got me really worked up. It got me really going and fired up. My class was like, are we having Sunday school? I said, yeah, but I need to take a breath for a second. Why? Because I can 
pinpoint all of the things that are going on in our nation that can t continue to destroy our nation. Anybody that says otherwise is not paying attention. <coughs> But this morning, as we turn to our text, I want to give you some good news. How many of you have asked, God, why do you keep letting these things happen? I have. God, why does it seem like Christians are losing? God, why does it seem like the churches and the Christians, the pastors that are doing the right thing, preaching the word of God, just as it's been written, why do we keep losing? Why are our churches getting more empty every week? Why are those things happening, God? It doesn't make sense. But it does make sense. Because the enemy has blinded people to the truth of the Word of God. In fact, he has even blinded pastors and ministers all over this country that say it's okay for all those things I've mentioned, it's okay. It's not okay. I believe that Bel Air, we're not perfect, we all know that for sure. But Bel Air strives to follow the Word of God and live the Word of God as often as possible. I believe that. I believe that the people of Bel Air confess their sins to God on a daily basis because that's how often I have to do it like 20 times a day, not just once a day. I confess my sins to God because the Bible says if you will confess your sins to God that He is faithful to forgive all the unrighteous things you did. All. The forgotten. You know, I love serving a God that has a bad memory. When he forgives it, it's gone. Thank God for that, amen? I'm thankful that we have that God. So what do we do? Because I'm tired. I'm tired, folks. And I'm one of the youngest people in the building. Besides Paula. I can only get through this with you. 
I've been copying nonstop. I didn't copy in Sunday school one time, did I? Not because of me, but because of God. There is victory. You're just not seeing it. This morning, as we continue in 2 Corinthians, I want us to see that we need a fight battles. Do not forget that as we fight our battles, we only fight them in the name of Jesus. In Ephesians, it says, put on the full armor of God. And when you have put on the full armor of God, it says to stand firm. Don't let anybody push you around. It means do not let the devil and the fallen angels and the people that he uses to push you around. You stand firm and you don't move until God says move. But when he says move, you move. God has given us a powerful, the most powerful weapon ever given to mankind is the sword of the spirit. The word of God is the most powerful weapon there is. We will see at the end that the sword of the spirit that will come from the mouth of our Savior Jesus Christ will destroy the enemy. We'll be there, but we'll just be spectators watching at the battle of Armageddon. In the beginning was the Word of God. The Word was with God, and the Word is God. John chapter 1. Jesus is the Word of God. Everything He says and does is exactly what we should say and what we should do. He's given us the weapon. But are you using it? In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, it says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid, notice it's in quotation marks, but face to face with you, but bold to work you went away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. This morning, the first thing is, a Christian should fight their battles by following God's standard, not the world's standard. Anybody in the room that's Baptist or Assembly of God or non-denomination or whatever, anyone in the room that's that before being a, a Christian, a child of God, you've messed up. I am not here to be Baptist. I'm here to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. Yes, the Baptist doctrines fit me the closest. I don't agree with all of them. And if you read the Baptist faith the message, you would see it doesn't talk about speaking in tongues and healing and all those things that the Baptists have fought over for years. It's not in there. What is in there is that we serve a God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And when we're saved, the Holy Spirit of God lives within us. That's correct. Amen? That's exactly what we are and who we are in Christ. You notice I said a Christian should fight their battles this way. Why? Without Christ, you serve, the person without Christ serves the enemy. You're either with the world or you're with God. That's your two choices. There's no other choice. There's not a third option. What Paul was going through was there were people in Corinth, the people of the Corinthian church that were saying, well, when Paul writes a letter, he's really tough and mean. But when you see him face to face, he's timid, he's afraid. If Paul walked in this room today, you would find out he was probably the least timid of all people ever on the earth. Paul had no problem telling you exactly what you needed to hear, right? We see that over and over and over again. But there were people trying to discredit Paul and the other ministers that worked with him. Why? 
Let me tell you, it's real simple. If the enemy can get me and my family, if he can get mom and dad and Paul and there and David and Delinda and Brother Ray, and we can go through the list, if he can get the leaders and the people who are faithful at this church to serve God in all the ways they can, if he can get us, everything goes easy for him from there on out. The enemy wants us to hate each other. The enemy wants us to fight each other. The enemy wants us to, to talk bad about people that aren't here or people that are going through things. The enemy wants us to do that. Why? Because the enemy loves working from the inside instead of the outside. If we let the, the devil have a foothold in our church, let me tell you, he'll take it. And the devil can destroy a church really fast. How? Through people. Paul, from history, tells us he was a little hot-headed at times. Not as bad as Peter, but he was still pretty hot-headed sometimes. He was hard-headed as well. He didn't, he didn't like change. He did exactly what he believed God was leading him to do. And Paul tells them, don't listen to them. Just because they say that I'm afraid of you when I get face to face doesn't mean it's true. Just because people say that the pastor of Bel Air hates people and hates things because he preaches against sin doesn't mean it's true. I don't hate people. If I hated people, you think I'd still be doing this? If I hated people, do you think I would put up with people that treat me terrible every day? Of course not, and you would not either. Everybody in this room is going through something, right? <laughs> Some of us have been considered worse than others. The death of a son. I, mm. I cannot imagine. I don't want to imagine. And there's many people in the room that know exactly why Kelly's going through. Because you've been there. You've lost a son. You know. I can't imagine. I can't imagine losing one of my grandchildren. My brother Ernie. I cannot imagine losing one of my nieces or my nephews. Like Kevin and Ronald. I, I cannot imagine. But some of you can and some of you can help him continue on and serve the Lord and get through this. Will he forget? No way. No one forgets that. Will he get over it? No way. That isn't how it's worked. Even when people say stupid things, it doesn't work that way. He'll always remember, but the Lord will get him through it. Just like he got you through it and you through it and you through it. God will get him through it. And you may be the person that God is using to help get him through. Your standards have to be God's standards. God does not say that sin is okay. But God is also a God of grace and mercy and love. He is a just God. But he is a God who forgives I know some people, and I have a lot of respect for them, that have become members of the school board. And they're in a battle right now. Because we live in a very liberal state that wants to do very liberal things and wants to teach our children things that are just utterly false. And they have to battle. And they have to battle people in the community that actually think thinks that that's okay. They have to battle pastors in this community who think 
there to show them God's standard, but doing at the same time showing them God's love and mercy and forgiveness and grace. Anybody being tore apart by other people? <laughs> Raise my hand five or ten times. Do you tell yourself all day long, Lord, I'm not going to let them get to me today, but they get to you the whole day? And then when I get home, I'm mad. A, a very close friend of mine told me, you ought to just go say something really mean and then leave. And her husband, who I worked with for many years, who's a good friend as well, told both of us that, that was a bad plan. Do you know what I did that day? I said something really mean and I left. And then when I got home, I felt terrible about it all night long. I immediately told Karen, you know, I did exactly what you and my friend Jeff told me not to do. Did that person suffer? No. But I did because I did something that God told me not to do, and I did it anyhow because I thought it would make me feel better. It may have made me feel better, it made me feel worse. And it made me realize that God's in control. It doesn't matter what people think about me. I need to learn how to turn them off. You know, my dad's hearing is formal. I don't like this. This hearing's bad. I know it's frustrating to him. He has 1% of hearing with his hearing aids. So let me tell you, if he takes his hearing aids out, they just shoot off fireworks right in front of him. He'd see him, but he wouldn't hear him. But there's days that I kind of envy him. Because I don't like hearing people talk bad about me all day. I don't. I don't like people accusing me of not working and doing my job. I don't like that. What I need to do is not listen. I told you last week, I'll tell you again, God gave me this really cool, innovative thing called a locking door that I can close. Guess whose air conditioner went out this week? Yours. I'm like, Lord, how am I supposed to sit in here without an air conditioner? <laughs> and take 50 calls from everybody else that their air conditioner broke in their classroom, too. God bless me with the young man, the student worker, who brought up faith. Woo! He said, I know it's going to be hot because. We need our Honeywell guys out there in the district so bad that we're thawing out our own HVAC unit and we're trying to figure it out. We're probably making it worse in the end, but we're making it worse. But I'm sitting here and I'm frustrated all week. And as I read this scripture every day, I thought, you know what? It doesn't matter what they say. I know the truth, and more importantly, God knows the truth. Amen? Amen? Don't listen to people when they turn you apart. You know the truth. If there's something you need to change, change it. But don't let the enemy keep tearing you apart and tearing up who you are. If the enemy can make you hate yourself, he wins. You go, well, I don't hate myself. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of people that do. They hate themselves. So when the Bible says love others like you love yourself, that's not good. They don't love themselves. In verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 10, it says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once, once your obedience is complete. You are judging by appearances. If anyone is confident that they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. The second thing, the Christians should fight the battles by using God's weapons not the world's weapons. 
Let's start with the world's weapons. I think we all know. How about lying? Is that the world's weapon? Yep, it's the devil's language. Don't forget who's running the world. It's cheating and stealing. His weapon, yes. It's deceit. The enemy's weapons, yes. It's causing people to be destroyed. Weapons of the enemy, yes. All of those things. But let's not focus on that. Let's focus on what God has done for us. Through the power of the word of God, through the power of Jesus, it says that the strongholds are demolished. Anybody do a demolition project lately? Here in about a year <coughs> or less. If you want to see what a demolition looks like, once we get the new Southern Heights Elementary School built, we're demolishing the old one. You ever seen a wrecking ball? Now, I'm not good at fixing, but I guarantee you, I'm a good demolition man. Even before I met Wes and learned how to do some things, I've always been a good demolition man. When I got to Bel Air, our fellowship hall had a wall that divided it in half. And then there was four little classrooms off of it. Our fellowship hall went all the way. And so Brother David and the properties committee and the deacons and the church decided that they're going to remove all of that. Kevin Keller was here. Yes, Kevin Keller and I behaved as children often. I'll just admit it. And so we had a contest who was the toughest. And we got as close to the kitchen as we could and to see who could run and hit that wall and not hit it. I kind of won. I didn't hit a stud. I went right through the wall and hit the other one. Kevin hit the stud, threw his arm, his shoulder out. I mean, it was, it was ugly. Kevin and I pretty much demolished all of our stuff. Now, when they came in to repair it and to fix it and to do all those things, I wasn't around. When you demolish something, you destroy it completely, and then you take all the trash that's there and you get rid of it. And there's no sign that there was ever a house or a school or whatever it is there. And God says, through the power of Jesus, I will de demolish, destroy the strongholds. What strongholds? Every one of you have them in your life. Those things that block you from being the Christian that God has called you to be. Those things that hold you up. Maybe it's a person, like for me, persons. Maybe it's it's a place. Maybe it's what you do for a living. Whatever it is, those strongholds just get tougher and tougher and tougher. And God says, I can destroy them like that. I think sometimes as Christians, we like strongholds. We like crutches and, and reasons not to be who we're supposed to be. It's easier, isn't it? Isn't it easier to say, I'm, I'm going to heaven, I'm good? It's easier. God didn't save us to make it easier. He saved us to lift him up and to change his world. That's why he saved us. And not just so that you could go to heaven. There's a lot of other people that need to go to heaven as well. Whose weapons are you using? See, because here, it says that he demolished the strongholds, and it says he, we demolished arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You take the knowledge from God's word, and you make sure that that's the standard. Here at Bel Air, again, not perfect, but here at Bel Air, we strive to follow God's standard, not the Baptist standard, not the whatever standard. We are here to follow God's standard. It doesn't matter if it fits in our tradition or not. 
God's standard is what we have to follow. And there are times that we miss that standard. And when we do, we need to ask God. We need to confess that to him and use God's standard. How many of you know the difference between right and wrong? All of you. Sometimes when you see Job, you see a kid with disabilities. <coughs> you see a kid that's pretty nonverbal. Not completely, but pretty nonverbal. That boy knows right and wrong. When I make him mad, it's obvious. Most Sundays, as he goes through, he does two or three things. Sometimes he closes the wooden doors, but definitely when he comes by, he shakes my hand. And he acknowledges that I'm there. And I acknowledge he's there. And then he tries to shut all the doors, right? I mean, he's kicking out door stops, and we're trying to stop him. And then sometimes he decides he's ready to go. And then I call him the goalie. It says, Brother Rick's the one who jumps out there and grabs him and says, okay, let's go. And he helps him out to the vehicle. <coughs> that boy knows exactly what's happening. Ask Paul on Wednesday night. He knows right and wrong. He may, be, may not be able to say it like I said, but he knows. I try to teach my children, my grandchildren, right and wrong. You know, when, when my grandchildren have to be got run to, oh man, I hate it, right? Grandparents, do you like getting on your grandchildren? No. Great grandparents, I'm sure it's even more so. We don't like getting on to them, but why do we? Because we love them, and we want them to know the difference between right and wrong. We want them to know God's standard. So here's the problem in this world today. Most people under the age of 40 do not know God's standard. I said most, not all. And I know that because they justify sinful things. And they don't do it to be mean or bad or whatever, but that's what they've been taught. They've been taught in school, they've been taught in society. So what do we do about it? We keep teaching them God's standard. Did all your kids do what you taught them to do? <laughs> Mom, don't laugh so hard. <laughs> of course not. Just the other night, for the third time, I was telling Theron what he needed to do. I have experienced exactly where he's at, and he's doing the opposite. And you turn to Sean, stop. So the next time she calls, he calls. I left the room because I was mad. And Karen talked to me. Now Paula will know this probably. I don't know. But the chances of him following all of Karen's advice is not that high. Because I know my son because he's like me. He's stubborn. And when he thinks he's right, he's right. <coughs> so why do we bother talking to him? Because I don't want him to experience the pain that I did. <clears throat> I don't want him to have to endure what I did. Can I stop him? No. Nope. And all the kids, I can tell when they've heard enough of me, they go, well, you know, I am an adult. And I pay my own bills. And so I can do what I want. You may not like to hear it, but it's the truth. They do what they want, whether I like it or not. <laughs> I asked the Lord that I must do two things today. One was cop, and the other is wear reading glasses. I just feel like I went from 52 to 92. <laughs> We're almost there. Almost there. Just remember, you're older than me. Uh, and now I have to look like, you know, those old, those old people, those old teachers that looked over their nose, and now I have to do that. <laughs> David, you're enjoying this way too much. Way 
way too much. Well, if he knew this in 1999 when they called me pastor, he had been giving it to me all the way till now. But we have a lot of verses. Verse 8. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters, for some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters, when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the spirit of service God himself has assigned us to, a spirit that also includes you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand, so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory. But let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Things up. The third point is that a Christian should fight their battles by boasting about God and not themselves. The word might supposed to be themselves because my computer kept changing it and I overruled my computer. Because I cannot control what you do, but I can control what I do. Paul says it's okay to boast, to brag. When you're boasting and bragging about Jesus, about what God has done. That's okay. That's a good thing. But my friend in the Philippines sends me a, a video of him baptizing 30 people and look, what looked like a mud hole to me. That is a reason to boast. 30 people got saved and 30 people followed the Lord in baptism. That's worth boasting and bragging about. Amen? But it's not about, about um, Wellnar, the pastor. It's not about Wellnar. It's about God. And he figured that out. He's a young man. He's not very old. He's a young pastor. It's okay to brag about what God is doing. But what the text says is when you start comparing yourself to people that you know, you think you know that you're better than, big deal. I know people who say, well, I may not be perfect, but I'm better than the pastor down at Bel Air. You know, I, I may gossip a little bit, but I don't gossip as much as, uh, I'll just pick on my mom. Mm -hmm. Because her standard is, if it's the truth, it's not gossip. But, you know, right. that's a completely different sermon. Amen. Amen. Completely different sermon. <sighs> Do y'all watch any of the commercials? <coughs>
to a, to a baseball game, a softball game. And the coach goes, Derek, you're up. I need a hit. And Derek Jeter, you may not know who that is, is a very famous baseball player. And another little short guy stands up and he goes, no, not you, Derek Jeter. And Derek Jeter goes out there and hits the ball so hard that it goes into the scoreboard. And you see this lady throw her glove down out of anger. Another one I remember is <coughs> there's a commercial, same, same commercial, and there's five kids and Charles Barkley. I don't know if you know Charles Barkley, pretty famous basketball player. He's definitely on the same weight program that I'm on. <laughs> and so these kids, these two kids are picking teams. Now, I don't know if you ever did that, but we did that a lot, didn't we, Kevin? We played basketball or whatever, and we picked teams. Trust me, you don't want to be the last guy picked. And there stands Charles Barkley, and the girl goes, um, I'll take you. And Charles Barkley goes, I told you so, I knew I still got it. And that little kid, the other little kid, rolled his eyes and shook his head. When you compare yourself to other people, that's what it's like. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter. If you want to put yourself to the real test, <coughs> match your life to the life of Jesus. Not even the life of Paul or Peter. Match your life up to the, to the life of Jesus and see how you do. Because Isaiah said, I am so dirty and unclean and undeserving. When I put myself up to God, I am the worst, useless, dirty rat that ever existed. Even Paul said that he was the greatest sinner ever, but he never met me. See, so he kept me context. As we say this morning, this is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded by the enemy, but I'm surrounded by God. This morning, if you want victory, God has given you the way to have victory. God has given you the way to demolish, not just knock down, but to demolish strongholds. To demolish what people are saying that's against the word of God. He has given you that victory through that. If there's a stronghold that needs to be demolished, let God demolish it. And once it's demolished, don't go back and rebuild it. In Sunday school this morning, we got into a little bit of a discussion about um, women. And, and one of our daughters had worked in a women's battered uh, shelter. And we talked about when women leave and hide, take the kids and hide out from their husband or boyfriend and beats them up and does terrible things to them, that 90% of the time they go back. That's never made sense to me, but I've, I've watched it over and over and over again. You know what the answer is to that? Don't go back. One of the saddest moments of my life. When I worked at McDonald's in Amarillo, there was a young lady who worked her way up. Hard, hard, hard working lady. I think she was probably in her early 20s when all this happened. She had, um, I believe, my memory's not as good, but I believe she had six children. And her boyfriend lived there, he was very abusive. He's not even got beat her up, beat the kids up. And one day she came to work and her, her face was cut and she had bruises. She could barely open her eyes. 
the back of her head, you can see this big knot on the back of her head. And I said, you, you can't keep doing this, it's gonna kill you. She said, do you think you can help me? Yeah, I can help you. So I called a friend from college who worked at the battered women's shelter there in Amarillo. And I told her the situation. And she said, well, she packed up and leave right now. And I said, she said she will. I said, she's got six little kids with her. And she said, fine, you meet me at this place. And so I went and I got them. I shoved a lot of people in my little car. We went to this place. She told me where they were going, but no one else knew. And they disappeared. That next day, her husband came in, her boyfriend came in, and he threatened to kill me if I didn't tell him where they went. I never told him. I'll tell you, I was, I was very scared, but I never told him. And I prayed for her, her and the kids every day. I just could imagine that they were doing so much better. About six months, five, six months later, she walks into the store and asks if, if she could have her job back. And I said, you're moving back. Yeah, I'm moving back. He's changed. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I begged her. I even said, hey, why don't you get your kids, come live with me, and uh, at least we can keep you safe. No, we're safe. We're good. Wasn't even two weeks later, she's at work. The police come into the building, ask to speak to her, ask if I would stand by with her, and I did. And this man had uh, been smoking weed, and he somehow caught the house on fire, and all the children but one died immediately. And the one that lived didn't live long. I'll never forget. I'll never forget seeing her and watching her crumble into a ball of, of nothing. And she kept saying, why didn't I listen? God will give you the answers. But you got to ask. Rick and I last Sunday had a discussion about how do you know when to help somebody with money or not? And we agree on the subject. A man that has asked for money about a year ago. I was upstairs, he came upstairs, he asked me for money in this situation. I said, Lord, you need to give me an answer. The answer was clear. I said, I'm sorry, I will pray with you, I'll do whatever you need, but I don't have money to give you. And he was gone. And he got out of this building quickly. I won't tell you what he said to me, but it wasn't nice things. God will give you the answers. If you want victory, it's right there. We need to remember things like September the 11th, 2001. And as the world seems to be going away from God, we need to remember that we're God's people. And we can I want you to stand with me this morning as we have an invitation. I'm sure to plan it for us today, since there's not here. This is your time.